Hello world, it's Craig. In my last video, someone astutely noticed that there was this Chem 1 in the background is next to my scope and logic analyzer here. And yes, this is one of half a dozen projects I've got going on, but I wasn't sure I was going to do a video on this. I picked up this Chem 1 a few years ago and I'm finally getting around to bringing it up. And I'll tell you off the bat that this 6502 has a damaged clock input. And I can force it to work, but it's not an elegant solution. And I guess most of this video is actually going to be about the clock in the 6502. And specifically, it's going to be what I think happened to the clock on this one. So I'm essentially the second owner of this board. From the overall system, there's no doubt that the original owner was very skilled in digital electronics. You know, he made some very complex additions and enhancements to this little Kim. He wire wrapped a number of support components, including a drive controller, a full interface keyboard, and you know a lot of other similar, you know, non-trivial type of enhancements. And I'm pretty sure that I got all the parts to the system and I put it back together properly, but I could see that there were some issues and I didn't have any documentation to what he did for any of the modifications. But for the most part, it was apparent what he was doing, even if I didn't, you know, completely reverse engineer how he was doing what he was doing. However, you know, my goals are different than what his were. I have other platforms that I use for development and tinkering, and I don't want to wire wrap anymore, and I prefer a bare metal system without disc controllers and so forth. So I decided that I wanted to take this board back to mostly its original configuration. Now, I always feel a little bit funny, you know, maybe even a bit sad when I start undoing things that was once, you know, someone's tour de force and, and probably their pride and joy. It was no difference in this case, knowing that, you know, this guy had put a lot of thought and planning and skill into these modifications. But I went ahead and I carefully removed the modifications. He had, the display was removed and it was off on his keyboard that he put in. He had a keyboard interface on this. I took most of those off. And as I said, most were apparent what he was doing. But there was one modification up here by the crystal. And I couldn't tell what, what he was doing. He had removed the default oscillator circuit and replaced it with what looked to be like a, a Pierce oscillator with a little trim capacitor and its own driver IC. There was actually a, a little 14 pin dip up here. You know, he drilled the board and, and uh, mounted a dip and you know, a number of other components were kind of just clued onto that spot right there. I figured maybe he wanted to play with the mainboard clock frequency. Maybe he needed more accuracy for some of the work he was doing. Maybe he only had a parallel crystal. And you know, honestly, I looked it over, I made some quick assumptions and decided, well, I'm going to go ahead and remove that frequency source in its entirety and go back to the original Chem 1 design. Some of these components over here had been removed and so forth. Well, that's what came back to bite me. As I was unwinding these modifications, I didn't run the board after each step. I decided to clean it up completely and then come back to address why it wasn't working quite properly. And in addition to that little circuit he added, I also noticed that he had removed the original protection diode, and he had cut traces on the back for pins 37 and 39 on the processor. And th those are the, the clock and the Phi 2 output pins. He didn't need those because he was creating a, a uh, frequency source from scratch here and patching those directly into pin 37 with a patch wire. So on the back, there's a couple of cut traces up here, and then there were patch wires that were bringing that crystal in. So I get the board you know, restored back to original, I fired it up, and now it was completely dead. Where it was flaky before, now it was, it was just dead. So as always, the first thing I do is make sure that I've got a good clock. And sure enough, there was no clock at all going into that 6502. Now, as a reminder, the 6502 has an internal clock signal generator, meaning it has the circuitry to generate a two-phase clock from a primary frequency input. It does not have an internal oscillator or a frequency source. You know, that's outside of the device using something as simple as an RC circuit. If more accuracy is needed, then a crystal can be used to set that frequency. And I know that can be confusing. You know, some spec sheets say that it has an internal clock, but it only has an internal clock generator to create the signals, but it has to use an external frequency source. So looking at the 6502 hardware manual, here's their recommended time-based generators. The bottom one is just an RC network with a 7404. Phi 2 on pin 39 is in phase, but a bit delayed from the clock input 
Phi zero on pin 37. So you can see how this RC network works once it gets a transition on the clock input at pin 37 that comes back out of pin 39 and then is then inverted and put back into the clock input. Without the RC components, this would basically try to run at the 7404 switching speed. And this middle diagram is the same RC network, but it has a crystal to stabilize the frequency better than the RC can do alone. So the natural oscillation is now the most stable when the crystal is at its lowest impedance, which is the crystal series frequency. Plus, it's got these little protection diodes over here to keep everything reasonable. And the top diagram is with the crystal operating in its parallel mode, where it has the highest impedance. So I had to redraw this from this mishmash in the Kim diagram into something that was more logical. And lo and behold, this circuit, which is actually the same as that, just just a different layout, is you know the textbook oscillator for the, the series oscillator given by the 6502 manual. So I go back, you know, having this, and then I started tweaking and fiddling with this and piddling around. I rechecked to make sure that I had used all the correct components. You know, I didn't have wasn't off by something in order of magnitude. Everything looked okay. So then I connected a function generator to the input circuit to drive the RC and force the issue. When I forced a one megahertz signal into phi zero, which is the clock input, then the board came to life and everything seemed to work okay. Display was fine, everything seemed to work, just some basic diagnostics. So what's going on? This RC network, with or without the crystal, relies on the internal resistance of this clock input to be very high. So this 330K feedback resistor can keep the internal transistors biased up to near their switching point of this device. And the volt told me that the voltmeter told me that this clock input on pin 37 was just a wee bit above ground, certainly not where it should be, up near the switching point of the device. Now fortunately, since the original owner had cut the traces on the back of this board, I removed the solder bridges that I had just put in so I could get a better handle on what was going on. And I removed the solder bridge on 37. I measured just directly how much current it was taking to bring that pin to a logic one. So I just forced pin 37 to a logic one, measured how much current it took. And I just, I finished taking that measurement. And I decided to make a video out of this because that's when it became interesting, has potentially some life lessons and where I think I figured out what uh, went out wrong with this board. Uh, the last user has a serial, his uh, social security number up there on the top of this board, so I'm trying to keep that covered. You know, it's amazing. Social security numbers, we used to use those all the time. And when I was in graduate school, that was our student ID was their social security number. So the answer to this question, when I, when I measured in that trace, it takes 8 milliamps to pull this clock input to a logic one. So that should be setting off all kinds of alarm bells when this FET input is taking several times more current than a standard TTL device. If we pull up the data sheet, the maximum input current on the clock is 10 microamps, not anywhere near the eight milliamp load it's presenting to this RC time base. So it's no wonder that this wasn't working because it was just being loaded down with that uh, current. So it seems you know, pretty obvious that this clock input has a blown gate or a blown barrier or some internal short on one of the FETs that are driven from that clock input pad. Now this all makes sense, you know, not only did the owner change this clock input by adding this driver up here, but this 7404 down here had been replaced. And I, I noticed that earlier, but I didn't think anything of it. But this 7404 is the inverter. So, you know, like me, I suspect, you know, something went wrong, he traced it down, he thought maybe that 7404 was bad, so he took it off, replaced it, and then started to realize that maybe things were you know, worse than just that. So I'm 99% sure that this clock input took an ESD hit somewhere that blew up its gate, and now it has severe internal current bleeding inside that chip. So it can easily manage you know, someone reaching down and touching this part of the board, you know, a clock lead, the you know, leads are very just sticking out there so I can just imagine you know grabbing hold of this and a zap hitting one of those leads of the crystal and that leads directly into phi zero the damage was enough to drive the current up three orders of magnitude but evidently not enough to change the functional logic of the internal clock phase generators 
Or maybe the 6502 is so forgiving, it can still run with a wonky clock signal. Or maybe that's why the board seemed a little bit flaky when I first brought it up. I, I don't know. So before I decide to do with it, if you're interested, let's follow down this little rabbit hole and see where the problem is most likely located and if there's a workaround. So here's the schematic for the 6502. Now, sorry, this is really hard to see. I tried tweaking it a bit. I'm not sure it's better. Here's pin 37, what they're calling phi 2 on this schematic. This is the clock input that will later be renamed as phi 0 uh, to the outside world. Over here is phi 2 that goes off chip, which is pin 39, which is now what we call phi 2, phi 2 still. Now they're in phase, but this output is going to be just a little bit delayed from the input. Now I can't understand why they called them both phi 2 on this. It's not like there's a name shortage. Okay, back to the input. Here is the input pad. Off to the left, it controls the gate of this bottom FET. So when this is taken high, this FET goes into conduction and it pulls this output line down. Meanwhile, this top depletion mode FET is just acting as a constant current source. So this first stage is just operating as an inverter and there's another inverter downstream where it, before it becomes phi two again. If the hole were in this gate, at least a hole big enough to be taking eight milliamps of current, then the output from this first stage would be following the gate signal and it would not be inverted from the gate signal. So remember, this isn't exactly metal down here. This is a semiconductor. So if there's leakage from the gate, a lot of that would turn into heat in that conduction channel on its way to ground. But some of it would go the other way uh, to the drain. And that eight milliamps would swamp out any biasing and it would strong arm control of the downstream circuit. And I looked at the clock outputs on this with my, uh, did my logic analyzer and my scope. And the, they seem to be absolutely correct with respect to phi zero, the clock input. I mean, they're textbook. So since the phi two isn't inverted, I don't think that this gate is the problem and more than likely everything is okay with the onboard clock signal generator to the left of this MOS. And that's comforting because I don't think that this little MOS could stand up to that huge heat load for very long. Now, rather than zapping a hole in the gate, it is possible that the surge went from the gate to some barrier somewhere else in this first FET, but the gates are orders of magnitude thinner and more sensitive. So I'm sticking with the idea that somewhere there is a damage to a gate somewhere in this circuit. And I could be wrong. Let's look at the die for a minute. Here's the visual 6502 image of that same area. This is the clock input pad. And look at this serpentine feeding the gate. It's here on the die image, but it's more clear on the visual 6502 graphic. Oddly enough, I fabricated and characterized a particular class of FET in gallium arsenide for my dissertation, but I'm way out of my depth here. So this is just a stab at things. I could be wrong on this. And if I'm wrong, you know, let me know. But do you suppose that this serpentine is for input capacitive delay, or is it meant to give some protection to this gate at the end? And certainly it would attenuate an ESD spike some, but I don't know what their intent was on this long serpentine. Maybe an integrated circuit design guru can give us some insight on that. Now let's go back to the schematic. And while we're on the schematic, I asked Ken Sharif about these little boxes with X's and O's. And he thinks maybe they are alternate configurations. So, you know, Connect X, don't connect O for one variation. Connect O and don't connect X for another variation. That makes sense. This T here with the X on one side and the O on the other side. So, you know, I believe that those are both not supposed to be connected at the same time. Connect the X and it has an internal clock generator. Connect the O and the Phi 2 input directly becomes the Phi 2 on chip. So let's go with Ken Schrift's idea uh, for the time being, unless somebody has a better idea. And they do create duplicate signals at multiple places. For example, this Phi 2 generator and the Phi 1 tap here by pin 39 is exactly the same as this circuit over here under pad 37. And on the die, I suspect these onboard Phi generators are these huge transistors here to the left of the input pad because there's another whole set of them over by the Phi 2 output pad. Both of these sets dump into this horizontal metal strip, which are the two onboard clocks. Okay, so back to the things that I'm more sure of. Down here is the current source we saw in that first stage, which served as a pull-up resistor. 
a depletion mode FET. It's self-biased. This bottom part connects to VDD, and this little J-looking thing is the gate connecting to the output. If an ESD pulse on pin 37 came in, it would have a tough time killing this. I would say nearly impossible. It would have to go through that input FET, and even then the gate and sources are connected together. It's pretty hard to kill this little beast. And besides, I'm almost certain this gate isn't damaged to the point that the FET isn't working properly because, as I mentioned before, the clock signals still look okay. So I think everything on this side is still functioning as it should. Something's just taking more current. Let's go back to the schematic and go out the other side of the pad. So over here is a little enhancement mode FET with the gate tied to the source. This is a protection diode that keeps the input from going too far negative. So you see, if this ground were more positive than the top part connected to the pad, the pad side effectively becomes the source and this ground connection, the drain, and the gate is now positive with respect to the channel and this enhancement mode. So it would turn on the conduction channel in an effort to keep the pad from going more negative. But if an ESD pulse comes in here, what do we have? We have a transistor that is normally off. A high voltage comes in on this pad side and unless it's a huge discharge, it isn't going to blow across the conduction channel to the source. It's going to blow through this ultra-thin barrier and into the gate, which is at ground potential. Because you can blow a gate out from either side. The pulse doesn't have to come in from the gate side. It can do just as much damage if the surge comes in from the conduction channel side. We just don't usually think about it that way. We usually think of the pulse coming in from the gate. Let's look at this on the die. It's right off and directly coupled with the pad. So it's in direct line of fire from an ESD pulse. None of that serpentine path business. This is direct and bulk connection of a protection device to the pad. It's there for protection, so they want it to be right on that pad. This is a beefy transistor that was designed to take a licking and keep on ticking. Even so, I can see how an ESD pulse would be too much for it. And its gate could be the one leaking to ground like a, like a sieve. And it's certainly generating some heat. You know, 8 milliamps on a steady input would be 200 milliwatts, but this is 50% duty cycle, so half of that 100 milliwatts is still huge. But that transistor is more likely to be able to dissipate the heat than, you know, some of the others in this circuit. I most certainly will never find the actual culprit, but I feel better now working through that in my head and seeing how this clock input could be significantly damaged in that protection diode and yet still seemingly function like it's supposed to, and, and seemingly quite reliably, even though it's taking a few orders of magnitude more current than it should. So now I need to decide if I'm going to replace the CPU. You know, this is soldered in. If it, were in a, if it were in a socket, this wouldn't be a problem. I'd just pop it out and pop in a new one. So do I replace this CPU, or do I just put in a little can oscillator? Oh, here they are. So I have some little can oscillators, one uh, megahertz, and these guys uh, can run that much current. You know, this would just overdrive it, make up for that leakage. And I can attenuate it a little bit before it goes in the chip. The input doesn't need to be the full five volts. A couple of volts should be plenty. And so then that drops the power to a few tens of milliwatts. And I don't know how reliable this board has been, but I'm guessing that it's operated you know, many hundreds or even thousands of hours after that input got blown up. So kudos to the original owner for recognizing what was going on and, and making a workaround. And I should have looked much more carefully at what you were doing here before I just scrapped it all. So there's a lot of unanswered questions here, but I hope you got something out of digging into the first little bit of the 6502 clock input. Let me know if you see the situation any differently, if you can fill in some of these unknowns, if you just disagree on how I think it all played out. Okay, thanks for watching. As always, this channel isn't monetized, so uh, I appreciate your clicks and your uh, subscribing and especially sharing. Talk with you later. Bye-bye.